Welcome to my Two Color Rose Transparent Watercolor Tutorial. This is a narrated step-by-step -step tutorial at normal speed. It features a lot of negative painting and the use of two colors to accomplish the painting. The photograph on the right was the inspiration for my painting. However, it was not an attempt to copy the photograph. I used it simply as a reference for my initial sketch of the flower shape and to get some of the basic values. The name of this video is Two Color Rose and I decided before I began this painting I would be using two colors that being sap green and the other color I'm going to use is rose matter quinacridone. I'm going to use these two colors in combination to accomplish this painting. And you can see as I mix these two colors how I can get a variety of uh, tones, a variety of neutrals. And I've taken those two colors, I mixed them together, and if, at the top there I've got more of a rose colored neutral, and at the bottom I have more of a, a green colored neutral. And a lot of times we, we would refer to some of these as mud, but it's really a neutral and playing the neutrals against the uh, more intense colors helps um, create a vibrant feel to your painting that you really can't get without the neutrals and you can see as I, I mix these with a little more pigment and less water that I can get a very dark tone so there's a, a dark green and now I can take more rose and mix that in and I can get a uh, a very dark red. So there's a range of values that can be achieved with these two colors and a range of color intensity depending on what the proportions are in the mixture. I can go from the pure green to the pure rose matter and it's quite a variety of color and it's certainly enough to accomplish this painting. So this is my sketch and this is what I use the reference photo for is to come up with my initial composition and just do a light sketch to get the basic form of the flower and also use the uh, photograph for reference for values but really it wasn't any intent to copy the photograph or the colors in the photograph. I'm working more just based on the mixtures that I'm going to get with these two colors I've chosen and my intent is to have more of a rose tone uh, flower. As you can see here I've started with a, um, a little bit of a, a rose colored neutral and it's a very much a middle value and I'm just selectively applying the paint in some of the dark areas of this flower shape and I'm applying this wet on dry and then I'm going to come in with my spray bottle here and soften these edges quite a bit and start to build a, a foundation of uh, layers that I can build on and build my values on. So the spray bottle will soften this and uh, any painting I do after I've applied this mist is really painting wet on wet. As I move through my painting process I'll repeat this uh, time and time again where I'll come in, I'll start with a wet on dry and then I'll uh, hit it with a spray bottle and I'll do a little wet on wet painting and um, then I'll dry the painting and then I'll start the process again and I'll repeat that many times throughout my painting process. Now I've switched to a middle value that's leaning more towards the sap green side of things and I'm going to apply some of this tone around the, the leafy foliage shapes that I've sketched. But I'm not being real specific on where I'm applying this. At this stage of my painting, I'm just applying a little bit of a loose wash. I'm letting some of this color mingle on my paper. And this will start to become a foundation that I can uh, build my values on. Once I've applied some of this middle valued green uh, to the general area of these leaf shapes 
I'm going to come in with the fine mist spray that I like to use and soften these edges. One of the things about watercolor is when you dry it, it, it ends up much lighter than when you applied the paint. So I've come in here with this middle, actually it's a middle to light value. And when I uh, stop and hit this with a hair dryer, which I do frequently in my process, this is going to look much lighter than what it is um, in this wet state that it's in now. As you can see, the uh, once I've dried this with a hair dryer, it's much lighter now, and it's, it's very much a light value foundation wash that I've put on here, and it's very neutral. It doesn't have a lot of color. So. Uh, now I'm going to come in with a with a darker value, and this is definitely more middle value, and this is leaning towards the uh, rose side of uh, the two colors, and I'm applying this value just in the areas uh, that I need to give some form to this flower, and as I work my way around, I'm being more deliberate where I'm applying this tone, but. I'm still softening it with the spray mist and at this point I still uh, am trying to keep these edges uh, more on the soft side. So I've been working my way around this flower shape using the same uh, application process and I've just about have uh, a basic form described for the flower and again I'm still keeping my edges at this point on the soft side. Now I'm starting to move more towards the sap green tone and I'm using a bigger brush here. I'm only, I'm only using for this painting just a couple brushes um, maybe three or four brushes and that's really all I need and this brush here is a uh, silver black velvet jumbo round small and it's a brush that I really like to use and it's just uh, a number of the silver black velvet brushes I, I really enjoy they're a blend of squirrel and synthetic and um, again this brush here is probably my one of my favorite uh, wash brushes and it's probably, I would call it my smallest wash brush. It's not a small brush, but a lot of times I'll use a one inch or one and a half inch flat brush to apply my washes. And here again, I've applied a, a middle value tone leaning towards sap green. And I've come back in with the spray bottle to soften that. And as I do that, I try and uh, get some direction going in my painting with the flow of that spray. And I'm, I'm trying to get some movement in this composition, moving from left to right, from the top down to the bottom. And I'm trying to direct when I, when I spray with that bottle on some of these uh, tones that I apply, I'm, I'm spraying in that direction and uh, trying to create some movement in my uh, composition. When I'm working uh, with washes like this and using a spray bottle like I am, I, you get a lot of excess water flowing around your paper and you do have to be aware of what's going on with that or you'll get some unwanted blossoms and uh, I, I again I periodically stop and dry my paper when I'm working in an area that I need to get back to wet on dry and it's a wet area I'll dry it with my hair dryer but as you get these beads of water developing in areas on your paper one of the best ways to get rid of those without disturbing your painting is just to take your damp brush and take most of the water out of it and just touch it to the bead of water on the paper and your brush will just absorb that bead right up. I'll use a damp brush in combination with the tissue to manage the water bead on my paper. And you can see now I've come in and I've dried this again and it's, it's much lighter uh, than it was when it was wet. And uh, I've got my wash brush here again and uh, I'm taking this rose tone and I'm just put in a few areas of the uh, on the paper there, the work surface, to help move some of this rose color through my composition. 
Um, I, well, I'm not using this because I was looking at a photograph and it said there's more red flowers, but I just want to give a suggestion that there's something else going on with this red tone and it helps move that tone around my composition. Now I'm using uh, a green tone here, still middle value, and I'm going to start to describe some of these leaf shapes, give them a little bit more definition. And to do that, I'm, I'm working in negative space. And my brush is an Escoda um, Reserva. And that's a nice brush, um, a good, good general purpose brush. They're probably not the, the least expensive you can find, but it's a nice brush. But uh, that's probably about as small a brush as I'll use on this. And um, as I was using the other wash brush, and I said it, I was, I'm only using a couple brushes, this painting is only 8 by 10 so it's not a large painting. It's a nice size little flower study. Uh, but I still am using that, a fairly good size wash brush on it. My brushes aren't tiny. And um, I wouldn't be afraid to, even, to be painting on this with a 1 inch flat brush if, if I uh, wanted to. Um, so don't, don't lock yourself into using teeny tiny brushes because you'll really limit yourself on uh, getting a nice fluid watercolor. That being said, um, if you were approaching this more as a botanical study and you were trying to get a very detailed, uh, more uh, a painting with more of an illustrative quality and an, ac uh, an accurate representation of a, a type of flower or something, then you you probably probably would be using much smaller brushes, and, and it's a much different approach than what I'm trying to do here. I'm just I'm working on a, f a free flowing painting, not necessarily an illustration or a botanical study uh, of a flower. And and to me, there's it's a different approach, and there's so many different ways you can approach a painting. Um, and you, and you just have to find what, what uh, style fits you best. My very first watercolor was a 5x7 painting of a waterfall landscape on illustration board painted with very tiny brushes over a period of about 10 hours. And when I was done, it was hard to tell the difference between the photograph and the painting. However, as time went on, I learned what watercolor was about and I don't paint that way anymore. That's not where my interest lies. But it could very well be uh, quite uh, interesting in an approach that somebody wants to take. So that's why I'm saying you have to find the style and decide on what kind of an end result that you're after. So at this point I've been describing these uh, leaf shapes, giving them more definition by placing this darker middle value into negative space. So by putting these darker values in the negative space, I've given more definition to the edges and uh, these leaf shapes have started to come forward and the background has started to go further in the back. And as I build on this, that's going to uh, continue to be my process where I'll be working to push some areas of the painting back and bring other areas forward by working through uh, painting in negative space. And here I've got a darker uh, middle value, a rose tone, and I'm going to start to give a little bit more definition to the, the form of this flower. And uh, you can see I have this process where I just go uh, back and forth. I work around my composition, and here I'm switching between the two tones. And the rose tone is more involved on the flower, certainly but I still have that rose tone flowing through my composition and I'm going to add to that a little bit at some point here in my process. I've continued to work around this rose shape, applying this middle value and then uh, softening it with a spray bottle. And you can see now I'm starting to build darker values into this flower shape. You can see I've thoroughly dried my paper here and at this point I want to try and remove some of my pencil marks that I used for my initial sketch 
And to do this, I'm using a kneaded eraser. I generally do my sketch with a B or 2B pencil, and I try to be as light as possible because sometimes it can be difficult to remove the pencil marks, especially after you start to build up paint over it. It seems to be more difficult. So I usually use a kneaded uh, rubber eraser or a, a soft white, extra soft uh, factus as a, a soft rubber eraser, and it normally does a pretty good job. But it doesn't bother me if I have a few marks left in my painting. Now I'm going to uh, be more deliberate uh, with some of my brush strokes and some of the marks I'm making. And I've got a, it's getting to be a fairly dark valued uh, green. And I'm working in negative space to, again, further define some of these leaf shapes. And one of the, one of the things about working with negative space is when two shapes come together, you get an edge. And at that point, normally one of the edge, one of the shapes becomes positive and one becomes negative and I often refer to them as a positive edge or a negative edge and um, at, at this point where I'm um, trying to give some definition to these these leafy shapes I'm working more on the negative edge what I refer to as the negative edge of the shapes there are times when two shapes come together and they're uh, they don't overlap and one's not on top of the other and, and you could have I guess two positive edges um, it's normally not a desirable situation because you normally when you have that you have what's called a tangent and, and tangents rarely add to good design and composition. You normally try to avoid tangents but most situations I think that there's one shape overlaps another and, and there, therefore you'll have a, an interior and exterior edge or a positive and a negative edge. Here I'm uh, starting to go darker with my value and I'm continuing this process of working off of negative edges and uh, it's starting to give more definition to the, the, the shapes that are more in the foreground and push some of these shapes that represent the background uh, farther back. As I start to develop these larger areas of dark green working behind this rose, and I have some, some lighter green shapes here too, it starts to give the suggestion of larger uh, areas of a value, even though they're broken up by many uh, smaller shapes. You start to have the feeling of a darker valued shape behind this flower and the lighter shapes coming forward. And I've decided I want to I want to give the suggestion of some other flowers in my composition. They weren't in my reference photo, but I just want to give the indication that there's something else going on here. And to do that, I'm just taking a, a middle value, middle dark valued rose color, and just touching it here in, in a couple areas of my composition. And it just gives the suggestion that there could be another flower there. And it helps take that, that rose color into some other areas of my composition. As I paint, most often I uh, develop my my painting as a whole. I don't start in one corner of my painting and go to the other side and and hit a finish line when I when I get to that point. I develop the painting as a whole. I work the various tones around the whole composition and I little by little I develop my values as a, as a whole unit, not just as individual little pieces of a uh, painting and you you are more likely to take that approach where you start on one side of your paper and just work across till you're done and when you're doing a rendering uh, of something and you're trying to do say a botanical study or something you might be more likely to take that approach but I uh, build my colors build my values uh, across the whole composition um, and to develop the painting and here I'm I've started to go very dark with my uh, rose and again I'm still using two colors here so every tone that I have in this painting to this point and till it's finished is some combination of um, rose matter, quinacridone, and sap green. I 
I've made a number of these uh, little dark red marks around this flower and, and I have to be careful. It's getting a little spotty on the left side of that flower. A lot of those marks, uh, they're all the same size and kind of shape, so it makes it look very spotty. So I want to address that and I'm taking in a little bit uh, uh, a broader uh, stroke of that value and on and, and wet on wet and soft soft edges to try and tone that down a little bit but I was getting so I had put these dark marks and they all look the same uh, so I need that variation of uh, size shape value now I have reached a point where I'm going to be much more deliberate with the application of my paint I'm trying to create specific uh, shapes and edges and bring specific areas out and I've got a very dark valued green and I'm using this quill brush I like to use it's not small but it's got a very fine point and it's I find it works very well for me for detail work so here you can see that I'm, I'm putting these uh, very dark valued brush marks and giving the suggestion of edges so you don't have to outline every shape with a line, with a line or a value. You you can start and stop edges and you can refer to it as lost and found edges. So you can get you know make a brush mark uh, along an edge and stop and pick it up a little bit further down, and the eye starts to complete that visually, and and you know as the viewer that 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 line continues even though you haven't drawn a line around it. Um, you start to let shapes of similar values merge into one another and you start to lose that edge and then you pick it up somewhere uh, along the way. And, but, uh, and that helps make for a, a much more interesting composition when you have that activity going on. I've mentioned a few of the brushes that I'm using uh, on this painting and I do get asked a, a lot of questions about some of the equipment and materials I use when I'm doing my demos. Uh, if you do have any questions, I've tried to make a comprehensive list of the materials and equipment I use and put them on the studio page of my website, rserwithart.com. So if you have a particular question about uh, a brush or paint or anything else I'm using, you can go to that page and uh, you should be able to find it there, but if not, you can always contact me. And um, this particular brush I'm using, I mentioned this quill brush. Like I said, I like to use it for detail work. It holds a lot of paint and it's got a very sharp point. Uh, as brushes go, it's a very inexpensive brush, but uh, I've found and others have found it's it can be difficult to find. It's made by black gold and uh, it's very inexpensive, but it is hard to find. So I have listed a, the source that I've found in the, in the States anyhow to get this brush. And I've seen a few sources in Canada, but uh, I really like the brush and I have probably three or four of them that I haven't been used yet just so I have them handy. Something else I like about using this type of a brush for detail or being able to use something like this large and still get detail is um, while it can make a very small detailed mark it also makes uh, interesting brush marks there's enough of a brush there to give you an interesting brush stroke if you want. When you start working with very, very tiny brushes, they can make small marks, but the, it's very restrictive on the type of brush mark it can make. There's just not enough there to make an expressive brush stroke. And, and using something like a quill, and there's, I think there's many different brands out there, um, but something like that, well, it has a fine point, you can still make an interesting brush mark. Here I'm taking this uh, rose tone again, and I'm I'm taking a darker value, and trying to move that tone again a little bit uh, around my composition. One of the things I like to do later in my process, after I've built up some of my values and started to give some definition, is I'll come in with a wash in areas to try and tie some areas together. So here I'm taking this uh, a little bit more vibrant green, uh, sap green, close to a pure sap green, and I'm putting it behind this flower and then I'm diffusing that color out a little bit with a spray bottle and it helps tie that background a little bit more together and makes the uh, flower shape more defined. And I'll come in and I'll apply some of that tone 
in a few areas and then I'll hit it with that spray and diffuse that color and it gives us a, a nice gradation of that that tone I'm going to suggest some some darker positive shapes I, I want to break that that large white leaf shape I have there that I'm going over top of up a little bit I'm not real happy with the the, the shape of that so I've come in with a, a darker valued uh, green tone and I'm going to work some of these uh, darker leaf shapes in the composition uh, coming out behind some of these uh, lighter shapes so I kinda have a play of light on dark then dark on light when I stick this in here you can see I give a suggestion of it coming out between behind the other leaf shape and as I put these down a few of these the one thing I want to be aware of is I don't want them all to be the same thing so I I'm varying how much of the the leaf shape is coming out and and the size of it and uh, and the direction of them but it just gives a slight indication that there's a, a darker leaf shape um, in 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 there and it it helps give depth and build layers into my painting I'm going to place one of these shapes here on the edge that that helps take that value to the edge of the paper and uh, makes for a more uh, effective composition I feel. I want to make this, this create a movement of a dark tone kind of working behind this flower so I'm going to start to build develop and develop the, the background a little bit more with some darker values and try and tie that together more as a shape that's moving behind the the flower and some of this lighter foil, uh, foliage and to do this I'm not just taking uh, a big brush and putting a big wash of a dark value I'm uh, doing it by building little shapes in the back of same the same value um, and they create some interest going on while I create the, a larger dark shape here and give the suggestion of this uh, larger background area here that's a darker shape but I still leave these light shapes moving uh, in front of them and the activity in front of them but little by little as I, I build these values back here that area is going to start to tie together more as one dark shape I started to develop some light dark uh, some larger shapes of the dark values in the, in the left top left and I'm trying to weave some of those values down more to the lower right uh, side of my composition and um, when I do a painting normally I, again I develop my painting as a whole as a unit I don't approach it um, as some people do where they say they're gonna paint a flower and then at the end they decide whether they're gonna stick a background in or not I don't paint that way I'm trying to develop a, a whole composition that involves the flower, the foliage, the negative space, and all the shapes throughout the whole composition. So I just don't think uh, that's an approach I like where you just you render, say, a flower or a tree or, or another object, and then you just try and stick a background behind it. I think you have to develop the painting as a whole, little by little, and uh, develop your whole composition. I just I just don't work where I paint something and then try and stick something behind it. It's just not the approach that I like to take. I've come pretty far here uh, with this painting and one of the things that I'll mention here is this is a, a composition that has a, a single flower with a suggestion of a few maybe in the background with some of that tone I put down but um, I do paintings that are much more involved and have multiple flower shapes, leaf shapes, and, and could be on a full sheet of watercolor, um, which is much larger to deal with than this uh, 8 by 10 size. But the, the approach doesn't change. It's just a bigger sheet of paper. I, I take the same approach. I develop it as a unit. I normally start with big uh, middle value washes, middle of light value washes and then I develop my values uh, little by little. I normally start with larger shapes and then work down to little ones and lighter values and work to darker values <clears throat> and I may have more soft edges early on in my process and, and uh, more rigid uh, harder edges as I progress and pr 
with detail. But whether it's a, an 8x10 painting or a full sheet 22 by 30 inch painting, my, my approach really doesn't change. Um, maybe I use much bigger brushes, but I use big brushes whether I'm painting on a little sheet of paper or a large sheet of paper. So um, it, it can be intimidating when you're working on, say, a full sheet, but really it's, it's the same process. It's just a little bit more area to, color, uh, to cover. This flower shape has a little too much uh, of looking the same everywhere to me. So I'm taking a little bit uh, uh, darker middle value, uh, very, very much leaning towards the row side of colors. And um, I'm putting on some of the areas of this uh, flower shape to push some of these areas back and just give a variation of tone going across the, the flower. Here I'm going to do some uh, some more detail on this flower, and uh, this is my darkest value yet that I'm using on my flower. And this is still a mixture of sap green and uh, rose matter quinacridone. Uh, it's just leaning a little bit more towards the red side than the green side, but it's a, a mixture with a lot of pigment, and not a lot of water, but it's still a pretty uh, fluid mixture that I have here. And I'm using that to put just some of the final dark detail marks down. I'm using that same dark valued red tone and taking it around some of the areas of the composition uh, that you might not think of in where some of the greenery is. And it takes on a very nice dark appearance and it's helped along by the fact that the red and green are complements to each other. So those, those kind of set each other off and, and the really takes that the that red and makes it a nice dark tone on that green. Now I'm going to take that uh, the darker value tone and I've got uh, more towards the green side now and I'm using the same brush with a very with that fine point and I'm uh, giving a suggestion of some linear movement in my my painting here. Um, I like to do this where I take uh, and weave in some linear shapes that are moving through the composition and it provides some some motion and some interest and I try and give a suggestion of a moving behind other, other shapes. You can see how I've, I'll put that brush down and I'll stop on an edge and I'll pick it up on a, the other side of the a shape and that, that helps build depth gives the suggestion of overlap so as I paint these I try to make them look like they're going under shapes and over top of shapes uh, and uh, sometimes I'll, I'll use some lighter values to a combination of dark and light value of these linear shapes and I'll vary the color on them also uh, but it's to me it's a nice effect and I like to use it in, in a lot of my paintings uh, especially with working with the florals. Now I'm taking a more pure uh, rose tone without a lot of green in it and um, I'm trying to put it where I want the viewer to come in and, and uh, draw the eye in. So I've, I've put touches of this, this red tone on the, the flower, then I've used the spray bottle to gradate that a little bit. And I'm going to work that red tone, just a few areas of my composition, um, just making a few brush marks and giving a little bit of uh, a spray to gradate it a little bit. But it just helps bring a little bit more intense color into my painting. So that's my painting, Two Color Rose, and as I talk throughout this video, I use Sap Green and Rose Matter Quinacridone were the only two colors used to accomplish this painting. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for watching. If you have questions about the materials, you could go to the studio page on my website, arthurwitzart.com, and I have a comprehensive list there of the materials and equipment I use as well as some of the most economical sources I've been able to find. If you have specific questions, you can email me at contact arsirwithsart at gmail.com, and you can also follow me on Facebook. If you like the video, please like it, share it, and comment.